Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, our Here Refugees podcast. Ted here, John here, welcoming you back into another excellent edition of the Arc Refugee Show. It is the Henny Darby edition. John out here repping his very unfortunate Ford Madison kit. I'm out here representing my team in Richmond. That's on Wednesday. We got no DC next week. Uh, no Spirit next week? Do we have Spirit next week? They play Portland, I, can't remember, I believe right? it's next weekend. There we go. Okay, so they so they they are not affected by the international break. Um, CMO, is this a USL League One podcast? It is a Henny Derby Week podcast. Let's just say that. I'm excited for the for the Wednesday game against uh, Ford Madison, which is a little bit disappointing. It is the only time uh, that I will ever f- uh, brook a League One discussion. This is it. This is this is the time <laughs> we're making it happen. <laughs> yeah, we're all we're all out here repping it. Um. But yeah, John, how was your weekend, my friend? I hope I hope it was well. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I think uh, you know made a little money on DC United on the weekend. That's always good. And then I really thought I was going to see some goals at Audi Field uh, on Sunday. Really should have, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, overall, pretty good, pretty decent soccer weekend. Yep, pretty decent. I refereed two games out in blistering heat. How are you feeling? Was are you loads of fun? Are you rehydrated? I'm, I'm I'm alive, which is I think is the most important thing to talk about. Uh Saturday was really bad. Sunday Sunday was Sunday it kind of cooled off a little bit. It got the the cloud cover sort of rolled in and kind of made it a little bit easier towards the the second game I had to do. And it was it was little uh it was like U11 U11 travel, which apparently they do. I did not know. You could do travel that uh that young, but I guess you can. Um, but let's, uh, let's jump right into it. Let's talk. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to start with DC. Uh, if you want to, you want to get on the show, talk spirit. We're, we're going to first talk a little bit about the, uh, about, about some, some, some happy news before we get into the distressing news, I guess you could say, or maybe the, on the verge of resolution news, I think, uh, is maybe what we're talking about it. Um, uh, but, but we're going to, uh, the only thing, <laughs> SC Mulch, the only thing that, uh, John can do to make Ted more mad is bring green sauce for the pupusas on the show. <laughs> I don't know. It's true. I think I'm kind of over. I'm kind of over his. I don't know if I'm over the green sauce yet, I don't, but I'm kind of over the Ford Madison trolling that he does on a regular basis. Well, you see, Ted, um, they they have a New Jersey where they have a QR code where you can buy someone a beer. And I feel like just for that, I almost, I almost bought it. I had it in the cart. I was like, this would make Ted slightly annoyed. I kind of want to get it. But $80 to annoy you is... I think maybe not the price I want to pay at this exact moment. <laughs> There's a limit. Right. There's a limit. All right, let's uh, let's get into uh, let's get into DC. Uh, DC United three one victors over the over the Philadelphia Union. Finally, finally, I, I still find it funny. I want to go back and watch the 2017 game because that was when DC was bad and somehow we beat Portland. I don't believe it. Uh, I don't believe it. Uh, I don't believe it at all. Um, but uh, but DC United picked up their first uh, victory against the Philadelphia Union three to one. Uh, let, let's start with right off the bat. Now, now let's start with the the thing that's off that's bad, uh, which was the fact that the game was not on TV because there was this. Um, uh, hold on, let me check my notes. Washington football team. Ball, I've never heard of them. <laughs> never heard of them at all. Uh, not occupying not one but two channels on NBC Sports Washington. So they uh, did not broadcast the game. Was only available online. I actually I recorded the encore because I was at the kickers game, unable to watch the uh, watch the game. I think the second half uh, so was record- on CSN Plus. I think like, I think they put it. Yeah, it was. But still, it was. It, they, the second half was there live, and then they did the encore. But the encore also uh, cut out part of the game, uh, which is not fun. Not great. So I was not happy about that. Watching my recording, something like I get like 15 minutes in, and we skip to like the 20th minute, and the uh, and in the first goal. And then the first goal for for the Union, but uh, DC got off to an absolutely flying start in that first 10, 15 minutes. They were just all over the place, uh, attacking. Uh, Jordi Reyna, like, w- 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 let's talk about him. And let's, like, let's to note that this should have been the Bill Hamid return game. Uh, yeah, wh- it should have been. So, so Bill Hamid came down with with COVID. Uh, he's vaccinated, mild symptoms, should be fine, uh, but was going to start this game. Uh, and then I think we heard about maybe an hour and a half before kickoff time from Goff that that was not the case. Then then there was a little piece of me that was like, this is the Chris Seitz game. They took a picture. They, Chris got a picture taken of him <laughs> walking into the stadium. This is it. Nope. John Kempen rolled out there nope. again. So he was – this is his first – I think this is his first – am I right this is his first win since he's come back? I think it, I think it might be. But there was a draw in there. 
Uh, you talking about John Kempen? Since, since the first, yeah, win? since this this most recent Hamid injury. Well, he 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 played he played a majority of the um of the Columbus games. I don't know if you want to call that a he, he came off the bench right. for that. Almost game. gave that away. Um, almost, <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, it is his first win. Um, I, I he didn't really have a whole lot to do in this no. game. I I remember a couple saves he had. Uh, so this wasn't a game where he you know saved us so to speak this was a game where uh dc just dominated philly uh really in the midfield uh both russell Knaus and junior moreno i thought were excellent uh sort of stopping uh the the union midfield from getting going uh defensively they were great obviously burn bomb gets the gets the knock with the own goal i don't know if you can blame him too much it kind of comes across his body he tries to make a play on it and it's just kind of a, an unfortunate play don't think you can say much on it um but uh but uh attack wise i mean that team, this team was flying. They were just, it was one touch passing. It, it's almost become, I feel like when I've watched DC over the past 10 years, I always, those moments always stick out when you could see them passing and moving. And this was the time I was kind of sitting there watching it. And I'm like, this is becoming regular. Like this is becoming like, it's only fun when they score it now. It's no longer like fun to see them do those, do those. It's still, it's still fun, but it's no longer like edge of your seat because I just expect it now. I expect this team to make passes, to do things. Um, and, and Jordi Reyna was, was by far the best player out there on the field. 100%. So Jordi, um, uh, it's interesting. So Jordi, after he scored uh, previously in the game, in the game prior, he played amazing afterwards. So basically he, he is a player that, if he can make a if he can make a positive contribution in the beginning of the game, after that he is just gonna he's gonna fly. And I think it's interesting because mm-hmm. the only other thing we really remember about Yordi from his half season last year uh, was that he uh, injured a guy and then fell apart and then was basically no good for the rest of the time he was there. So like he had had a reverse reverse action, but now he scores a goal in this game off of a rebound from a Ola Kamara uh, header from inside the six, puts it away. And then he starts dribbling past people. He is saucing it up all over the left wing. He is playing with hyper confidence, and he has now he's got four goals in his last mm-hmm. his last five games. Maybe I think he's made team of the week twice. Yeah, he he was on the bench for the team of the week this time, but yes, and so that's yeah, it was it, so that is I think you know I had written him off as a, as a function mm-hmm. for the rest of the season based on his salary, based on his contribution level, based on his confidence when he got on the field, but really. He looks great when he plays with Edison Flores. Like uh, they're they're not having it's not like a a Lucharu situation where they they need each other to to contribute because Yordi was has been playing well even when Edison wasn't on the field so far in this last maybe month and a half. Uh, but they do find themselves pretty pretty quickly and they, and they do have a very good chemistry. So let's hope that uh, let's hope that that continues. Yordi Yordi is a X factor that this team really needs when you look at the attacking depth otherwise. Yeah, what did you um what did you think of Edison Flores in this game? I'm curious. He he didn't he didn't uh register anything on the score sheet. Um I, I thought he was I thought he made some good plays. There's still there's a lack of like sharpness and just I, I guess game changing ability uh from him, if that makes sense. I'm not I'm still not quite seeing it yet. Um his foot bob rating was five point five, so uh, foot bob did not think he was no he was very good. He was better the previous um, game. That he also came yeah. off at the 65th minute, so it's good that you're it's good that you're a player in that position was having such an ineffectual night through 60, and you're still you're still just putting a walloping on on Philadelphia. Obviously, the full team pressure was was in effect the entire night. You know, it burns up these players, right? I think that there's some soft tissue injuries maybe as a result, but you cannot argue with the results that that this that gets most of the games that it plays. Obviously, sometimes it doesn't work out, but uh, as a as a viewer of this team, um, I'm not a neutral, so but I imagine as a neutral, you've got to enjoy watching DC United play uh, when they're when they're actually doing the thing that they're known for now. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun to see the team have an identity, and I think we've talked about this. Um, you know, I think I think it, it creates a conundrum. I think for when uh, you know we 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 we're pretty much certain that Ariola is going to come back. Um, they say he's been day to day. He's got a two week break. He's not on the World Cup um, roster. Uh, I don't know though. I think um, Timothy Way uh, picked up an injury, so they better not. We'll they better not maybe. pull him in there. Leave him alone. Yeah. Leave Paul alone. <laughs> you don't think you think like a trip to El Salvador and Honduras would would do Paul Mm-mm. do Paul some well? Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, we talk. Uh, what, what 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 an important thing to bring up. One important thing to bring up. So as much as we've talked about this team 
you know, one factor of this team has been they haven't been getting too many draws. So they're winning games. They're obviously nine wins, 10 losses. So they're still, you know, you'd like to see that maybe be bumped up a little bit. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe this aggressive style is uh, paying dividends in MLS because uh, you the the wins is the first tiebreaker. Total wins is first tiebreaker. So I almost uh, like they're almost in a better spot where if they're tied on points with, uh, let's see, Orlando, uh, sorry, Nashville, uh, Philadelphia, Montreal, they right now have the upper hand over them because they have total wins. Uh, they have the wins column. So I think that's something interesting uh, to kind of keep an eye on this team. We, we, we've lamented some of this team, you know, giving games away. And that's not good. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're in a position where you're draw, you're, you have a draw, you should take it. And you should take uh, finish out that point, um, and you know it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but I think the style of going, maybe going for wins, pick, is is causing them to pick up wins where maybe other teams maybe settle for a point. Um, you know, I think about the Columbus game. Uh, that's a game where they went all out aggressive. It worked, and they they could have played conservative. Probably most teams would play conservative in that sense, and they they picked up a win, and that's a that's a that's a big win for them. So um, we should we should also talk about the Abela. Uh, rope dope goal that he scored to, to sort of ice the game. Uh, I think yep. we've all have seen the replay by now. He was <laughs> the, uh, the only, I think you said it on Twitter. The only person in the stadium that doesn't think maybe at the moment he was offside with, was, was the AR or was the linesman. Uh, <laughs> and he, yeah, it was the most funniest goal ever. He played that to his advantage. He just, he, he, he did a, I, an okie doke is the only thing I can think of to say. Basically, he just did a, he did a, uh, five-star skill move for no reason, uh, uh with his back to goal. Uh, and then outside boots, right foot, Ricardo Quaresma style uh, into the net to 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 ice the game to to make the margin three one. Yeah, uh, Abela is now second in the league in goals per minute uh, <laughs> behind Kamara goals. Uh, so that is a uh, uh, Minnesota United was very very smarmy about that about that move uh, for their fans. We're very much like good luck with this guy. You I don't know I don't know if he's gonna work out. He's kind of sucks and uh, he's he's looked okay. I think I think that. Lasada knows that the way that you have to deploy this guy is like super sub, like 15, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. He's not gonna have he's not gonna have the legs for it, but maybe he can make something happen uh, at the close point. But um, we, and I think I think I think it more sticks to the mind. You know, that there are a lot of players that get you know it's sometimes justifiable they get written off when they get traded or something happens. Jordi Reyna got written off by you know Vancouver fans. They're like, yeah, good luck with him. Uh, and written off by DC fans and, you know, and podcasts it, it, and podcasters and podcasts <laughs> and podcasters. I think Albia is sort of the same thing. You know, just he, he wasn't a right fit. Um, I think there is something to be said. And, and I'll have to look at um, I'll have to look at Minnesota's. Uh, I think Minnesota is going to struggle uh, if they bringing in Latin American talent with where they live. Uh, unless you're able to sort of surround them. Um, I, I'm not convinced Adrian Heath is as good of a coach as, as maybe some want to make him out to be. And I think maybe it's just an environment that didn't suit Albia. And then he comes here, he comes to DC. Uh, there's a, a much higher, you know, Latin culture on the team. There are you know, 900 Argentinians uh, just hanging out, drinking yeah. mate. So I think that, I think you're right. You have an Argentinian coach who probably at maybe at some, at some point they've had interactions at, at points and that can make the difference. That can make Ooh. you more, um, that can make you more. Uh, <laughs> was it da- dazed? Uh, Porpa says Heath is Heinza with results. We'll see. We'll see. I, I I feel like I feel like Heath's Heath's shtick is gonna eventually run out uh, with Minnesota. What's uh, uh, We'll we'll see about that. Let's let's bring Rich on here to to, to talk about this game here for a few minutes before we get into the spirit. Yep. Rich, what you thinking? What's on your mind? Hey guys. So um, man, that was a, that was a really good game, and I think that uh. For me, it's just not about the players. We have so many good players now. We're so deep. But I think it's all because of the system. And I think that when you watch, when I watched the game, what stood out to me was they would score, and the whole team, all the subs would just, like, mob the guy. And it was just they're having so much fun, and they're, they're buying into the system. And when you have that, you can become unbeatable. Absolutely. I think that, yeah. that that matters more than than many things. A, it's 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 easy to be engaged and joyful when you're winning. And although the team hasn't really been, you know, winning a bunch of right now, so I guess that that's not the total excuse, but the 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 camaraderie is good. The vibe in the locker room continues to be good. DC has had a good locker room vibe 
for quite a while, for as long as we've been covering the team officially. Like, there's not been, even in bad years, the team stays together. You're not hearing leaks in the locker room. You're not hearing players snipe at either the coach or each other. Uh, on, the, on the field, generally, you're not seeing a lot of disagreement. So I think they're just generally a agreeable group of guys, or at least professional, that they can sort of keep their keep their disagreements out of the public. But right now, Rich, like you say, they, they are all bought into the system. They're bought into their roles in the team. There doesn't appear to be anybody that's, you know, vocally talking about that they think they should be doing X or Y or playing more minutes or whatever else. It's just been everyone is bought in to try to get where they can get with this roster that they have built. Yeah, but they also, the funny thing is that this style seems to work for MLS. I've been saying it for a long time is MLS defending sucks. And if you, it's the same thing with the national team. You should be attacking because more often than not, you're going to score. The team that scores the most goals is going to win. And you can even see it when they lost these last few games. They didn't seem discouraged. They seemed like we can score, we can score. And they just kept going. So I think there's something to that. And, and I think that it, this team has something special in terms of, you know, the attack mentality. And, and like, I agree with you, like, um, Flores didn't seem like he had it totally, but he still contributed. He was, he was big part of the pressure turning them over in the, in their own half. They couldn't get the ball out of their half the first, first 20 minutes. Although I couldn't see yeah. it on TV. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think I think I think the most important thing, um, the, the most interesting thing I think was a stat from from Matt Doyle. Uh, this team has had the highest expected goals turnaround from 2020 to 2021 of any team MLS team ever. Now again, it's a smaller sample size in 2020, but still, it's been a. It, and and you're right about I I don't think I don't think necessarily MLS defending is terrible. I think uh, if you follow the money. Uh, you can see why maybe the defending in MLS is it's more it's it's it is a lot about the top end talent in the attack when you've got three, four, five million dollar players versus, you know, three, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar defenders. Uh, you're going to have some lopsided results in a lot of games uh, we saw. But, hey, it's actually it makes the league entertaining. Um, I mean, that uh, Dallas um Austin game was was absolutely nuts to watch. So, cool fest. Uh, Rich, thanks so much for for calling in, man. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, uh, th- thanks for thanks for giving your thoughts. We uh, we always have cool, a good game right before international break. <laughs> that's how we do it. <laughs> we we beat Inter Miami in Miami, sort of like we got this thing, and then you know there's time off. That's what we do. But uh, we we promised that we were going to talk spirit, uh, so we should do yeah. that. So. Uh, we're going to talk about the game also. There's less to say about the game. I think there's some stuff that happened mm-hmm. at the game. I believe Angus is going to call in uh, in a little bit and, and talk about that. But the amount of news out of this team off the field in the last three weeks is bananas. I think it's three weeks. Maybe it's two weeks. Maybe time yeah. has folded in on itself. But uh, the biggest hammer to drop today uh, was a article on the Washington Post. Uh, but this is, I think, joint bylined of uh, Molly Hensley Clancy who was the writer of the previous uh, story that came out uh, that the Richie Burke firing slash uh, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever, whatever we're currently calling it. And Stephen Goff also sort of contributed to this post. But the interesting thing here is that the, the owners of the spirit are sort of fighting it out and privately until very recently, until this morning at four, at 4 AM when the article dropped. Uh, but, uh, how, how do we how do we get started here? So so basically, it, well, let's. I, I do want to. I want to start with. I want to start with one thing that that happened. It is, it, it is incredible to me. All, all the all the all the goodwill, all the goodwill that this team had in in twenty twenty, uh, with the, with the with the Challenge Cup and just everything involved with that. It, it just seemed like this team had such good will. We were talking on the show about how much more excited we were about the Spirit than DC United that next season. And just to watch them squander it, I, I do want to bring up something they did. And, and you know, I, I, who knows who the who the genesis of this idea was, but uh, they, they the game against the Courage was a service member appreciation night. Not, not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. Uh, you know, the teams do this all the time. Um, but they invited uh, General uh, Michael Hayden, uh, a very controversial figure, uh, a person who was a part of administrations that did some very, very uh, questionable things. I won't dive too deep into what he did, uh, but this almost seemed like you – know, like on the one hand, you have DC United doing a Pride Night, doing a Pride TIFO, 
you know, putting forward all these ideas. And then you have on the other end uh, a organization that's putting forward almost – almost I don't want to say an opposite view, but a view that's very different from I think who what the fans they have. Uh and that that to me was very shocking and, and to see. It was almost like it was like they it was almost like they can't get out of their own way at this point uh by doing something like that. And then we can talk about the article and 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 Yeah, I th- I think we can talk about the game. Yeah, I think specifically about that too. I was having a conversation in the press box during the game about that and sort of saying what that was the discussion on Twitter before is does the team know who its current fans are? Do they care? Do they want different fans? And do they think this is the way to go about it? Uh, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a strong possibility that the perception that we all have, so we're all, you know, we're podcasters. We interface mostly with very online people on Twitter and Facebook. Not really on Facebook. Uh, Twitter and Twitch and the chat uh, and sort of the super fans that are there week in, week out. We know what we think. We know what we know what that that group thinks, and the question is, is is it is this one of those Twitter not real life things? As far as how, does this bother the random person in the fans or in the stands when you're looking at families of you know families mom and dad with three kids sitting out there eating a hot dog in, in the cheap seats? Do they care? Does that bother them? Or probably not. That's the, that's the, always the struggle, right? Or the people that maybe yeah. are in the Eagle Bank Club who buy the two thousand dollars seats are they bothered by it? If they're bothered by it, it doesn't happen. If they are anti- if they have antipathy about it, then it continues to happen. But I think, on and the whole, just like the Anson Dorrance hire, just like there are a bunch of things that you just don't put out there right now unless you are trying to antagonize the group of people that you do know won't like it. So, like, just sit on this. Like, you didn't. This is this is not something that had to happen. This was something that mm-hmm. was cho- they chose this to, to to do this now. Obviously, I think probably the Armed Forces Day was probably in promotions long, long before, but. Special guest. He didn't get brought up. He wasn't. Maybe he was at the game. He didn't get. There wasn't a PA announcer talking about him. So like it literally just existed as an online post that that pissed people off. Basically, is what it all boiled down to. So that's that's interesting. I wonder if I wonder if the response though provoked them not to not to do it. I, I don't know. Well, we can talk um, about what the know. front office <laughs> decided to yeah. do at the game. <laughs> that about, about yeah. Let's let's. Let, let's uh, let's go ahead. Let's uh, let's bring in um, let's bring in Angus star of, uh, star who was at the game star of print and screen Angus uh, <laughs> man man of the hour Angus are you on there? Or I bet yeah. <laughs> Congrats on your first Washington Spirit game. Very very uneventful. Very normal. This happens all the time. <laughs> so I'll I'll, I'll 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 set you up. I'll I'll, sorry, I'll set you up. So. Uh, if you watch the game uh, on Paramount Plus, this, I believe it was on Paramount Plus uh, this weekend, you may have seen on the coverage uh, a, a sign that said "Sell the team, Steve." I believe it said. Uh, you may have only seen it briefly because it was taken down or asked to be asked to be taken down. It was put back up. It was asked to be taken down again, and then later on, the, at the end of the game, uh, there was a chant by both the Spirit Squadron. Uh, the, the folks that were there from Rose City Collective, and then also the traveling North Carolina Courage supporter group that was there, uh, sitting in the same group, uh, chanting "Sell the team." So, Angus, you were a central part of this, but I believe you were one of the people holding the two poles. Is that correct? Yes, yes, I was. Um, uh, a lot of you may know Douglas uh, Reyes Teron. He um, he's a good friend of mine. Um, met him through DC United and stuff like that. Uh, one of the reasons why I was actually at the game in the first place is I knew he was going to be there. And um, I was like, hey, uh, I saw the two pole and I was like, hey, are you planning on putting this up? And he goes, yeah, I'm like, do you need a hand? Because it's pretty wide. And he's like, yeah, of course. Uh, anything anything I can to help would be great. And I was like, yeah, um, no worries. And so I held it up. And then we were thinking, and we took it down after the first minute. Um, but a couple minutes into the game after that, we were like, oh, let's put it up full time uh, so people could see it. Because there were other banners being put up that the squadron put up or were in the squadron section um, that you could see on the broadcast as well that says, uh, I believe, listen, believe, and protect. And then there was a smaller banner underneath that. And so we moved into one another section to put up ours where we slid it between the safe standing and the seat itself. Um, and actually, if you look at the broadcast, uh, you could see the moment where security kind of clocked on and um, came over to us to tell us to take it down and that was at about two with uh at 
219 left at the 47th and 19th second mark of the first half, so into the added time mm-hmm. section of it, um, is when they came over. And uh, I got Dougie's attention because it was his uh, it was his banner. And I was like, hey, they're trying to take it down. What do you want to do about this? And he's like, um, and so we start, we, he started having a conversation with the, uh, with the guest services folk who came over to uh, ask us to take it down. Um, the main talking point was uh, the, what point of the fan code of conduct does the banner violate? Because to our knowledge, it didn't violate any set forth by NWSL or um, in this case, DC United and Audi Field, because the Spirit actually does not have a fan code of conduct readily available for its fans to look at, um, or at least easily accessible to our knowledge. One will be coming soon, and Angus. <laughs> most likely, yes. Uh, probably with an that says any hate against uh, the front office or ownership. Please do um, not be... The, the, the rules will say, don't be mean to me, comma, this is Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was at that point where I asked the, uh, the the guy who wants us to take this down, and um, his response was the ownership, and didn't go any further than that. Um, and that that's what I heard um, from him. I don't know if that's exactly who asked for it to be taken down, but that's who he used. Whether or not that was him just trying to get us to get it down faster or not, I don't know. But that's what was said to me. Um, and you know, after asking. And him not having an answer for us, he um, decided to get in touch with a different rep from the team. And this is when I noticed, and a couple of us also noticed, a lot heavier security presence in the um, supporter section. Uh, For those who haven't been to a Spirit game, um, and having been at both the DC United game and the Spirit game, um, the security is a lot less um, hands-on in the supporter section during Spirit games. But the amount of security that started walking around during halftime down on that front row where the smoke machine usually is for DC United games definitely was a lot. Um, it was a pretty substantial increase from that that had been walking around during the first half. Um, it's been brought to my attention and a couple of our attention afterward that there was actually a police officer waiting outside of the section out of, uh, out of eye shot um, just in case things got bad, I guess, um, whatever. And so eventually um, the other spirit rep came and um, Douglas said this best uh, to Molly and the other reporter that were there. But um, I'm, and I'm trying to do him justice here because I, I spoke with him earlier about talking on the show and he's like, hey, I won't be able to call in, but um, just do your best. And I was like, OK. Um, so from what I can from what I remember, uh, he said to them that the reason it was taken down and the agreement that was brought uh, to, in place was that we would display it for the first minute of the second half and then take it down, um, mainly because there are good people in the organization that we do want to protect and we don't want their jobs to kind of go away because there are connection with the front office. And we've already seen that that connection can kind of get squandered really quickly under this ownership group, you know, for whatever reason you might want to take. And so we wanted to kind of make sure that there was still a, uh, a good relationship or at least a relationship between the fans and the front office because we don't want to alienate anyone. Um, the sell the team chant um, was also an idea of both Douglas and I um, at the end of the game. Uh, I talked to him about it because they took our sign down, but like, how are they going to kick out an entire supporter section with like two minutes left to go? And um, there was a quite, a, and, and there was, there, it's a friendly group between us and the courage supporters who were there. And um, we asked them if they would please stand in solidarity with us. And they said, yes, of course, anything you need. How would you want to do it? And so they actually brought over their whole group and they brought over a drum and they all joined us in our part of the section to do that chant. And yeah, it was it was an experience for sure. Um, it's quite funny because I've heard and seen a lot worse being said about ownership and the front office at DC United Games and being chanted at, out of the DC United supporters section to no response from the front office or ownership yet a banner that has no real, that, that has nothing to, that nothing violates uh, get such a large um, uproar was interesting. Clearly it struck a nerve. I think, uh, I think the reporting that came out uh, this morning about the fact that there were previously already discussions underway 
to uh, for Steve yep. to sell his shares to Michelle Kang, uh, almost an agreement sort of in place already uh, uh, to do so. And then he sort of backed out at the last second and dug his heels in and didn't want to do it. Clearly, the suggestion to sell the team uh, is is in in the front of his mind. He's very touchy about it. I think, too, at the last Spirit game, I think someone sort of popped out at him with that sign, like in a hallway. <laughs> like someone had like a gorilla sign uh, and, and, and showed it to yeah. him. So... Somebody else did have a lot smaller of a sign. I forget exactly who it was, but I did um, I did see them on at the game and then later on Twitter as well. Um, I forget who that was, and I apologize to that person if they are listening or do listen in the future um, for not crediting me with this. But I did see another sell the team uh, sign, and um, I don't believe that it called out Baldwin personally, and maybe that's why. And also it was smaller, so it didn't really get on the broadcast, and I think that was the main issue was if you look at the, the screenshot of the broadcast view, um, you can very clearly see it above the uh, the goal that the Spirit were attacking towards on the first half. So I don't think that that really uh, looked good on the uh, for the front office people who were or were not in attendance. I don't know if they were or were not. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I don't want to steal any thunder from, like, the squadron or, like, Rose Room Collective because, like, again, I've only been to one game and I was just helping out a friend, and this is just what ended up happening. Um, but uh, I really do like appreciate all the work that they're doing, and if you do want to get out to a Spirit game and do want to support this kind of movie, do it. please do. I highly encourage it. Good atmosphere. It's a great group of people. They're doing terrific things, and I can't speak highly enough of the people at Rose Room Collective or at the Spirit Squadron and those North Carolina Courage fans. I forget their supporters group name, and I apologize to them. The, but the uproar is for what the name. Every, yeah. Um, for for what everyone did yesterday at that game, to basically support one of our own was pretty was pretty terrific. And Angus, we're not here we're not here to give uh, PR advice to the owner of the Washington Spirit. <laughs> but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that I uh, I would say about two thousand percent more people know about this uh, mm-hmm. after this after the sign being taken down. Uh, you got you got press in the post. You got press in uh, where a whole bunch of places, right? I saw. I, th- I thought I saw some uh, some other sort of larger yeah, national DeFactor. publications. Yeah, De- I think it's DeFactor. Um, they wrote a piece about it that uh, that I believe that was one of the the two people who were um, at the game. And by the way, Molly was just at the game to be at the game. Like she wasn't even there as a story or anything. She was there as a fan and just enjoying herself. And then she saw the banner and then she saw the little kerfuffle going on. And so she actually came up with like food from the concession stand in hand, because that's what she was doing beforehand. Like she had like a hot dog and fries and was like, Hey, what's going on here? (laughs) And that's how, um, that's how that happened. Um, So that's how the media really got a hold of this. Um, And I'm glad they did because it is pretty important. And like Goff's article today, um, the one that, came out detailing more of like the Burke allegations and stuff like that pretty much shows that I don't know there wasn't exactly some nice things going on behind the scenes in terms of that hire and if Mm -hmm. um, all of the claims are true he probably shouldn't have been in in the job to begin with so um, I can really only put that on the the guy whose kid Burke coached right who put him in power in the first place yeah we're getting a lot of we're getting a lot of uh ideas here in the chat about potential spirit sponsorship with edible arrangements, uh, which I think is great uh, for those of you who know what that's about on Twitter. Uh, but yeah, Angus, I, uh, you know, I think you've done a really good job here of, of describing it and also making sure that everyone knows that this was a team effort in the stands. Uh, and I, you know, I don't imagine that it's going to stop. I think that, I think that for me personally, I feel like we're at a, we're approaching a tipping point here for this, the number of stories that are coming up, uh, the, I think now the league is going to have to probably come out a little bit more, uh, uh, put their weight around a little bit. And I also think that this, the, uh, the investigation into Richie Burke's termination or the allegations around the termination, I think it's probably going to come out here pretty soon. So, uh, I think I, you know, keep, keep at it. I, I, you know, the show, the show is, uh, is, is pro this. I, I, I would say we're, we're pro this movement. Ted. We, we agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so yes. I, I think this is a really great, uh, sort of 
thing to see. It, you're uh, you're 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 keeping the pressure on, and it seems to be it seems to be maybe making results here pretty quickly. And I don't I think if DC United fans thought they could do this, they would have done this already. <laughs> I don't think it worked. I don't think it worked as easily uh, for DC United. I think there was obviously extenuating circumstances here for the Spirit. But um, Ted, did you have any you have any questions for Angus? No, no, I, I just yeah, I appreciate you know the work Douglas and, and him did, um, and in in showing you know showing in a respectful way. Um, I certainly appreciate you know I'm somebody who uh, who who gets on you know the people that that yell at the uh, DC United Twitter handle or the teams a team Twitter handle, you know. So I think res- respecting the people who work there, um, and you know we, we we've had uh, relations relationships with the. Uh, with the spirit media people and they've all been fantastic i mean i can't we have not had a bad experience with working with the washington spirit uh but there there's a larger there's a larger thing going on with this with this team uh, and it comes from the owner and i think uh i think you guys did an excellent job and and i think the, the way you guys handle it uh, as respectful as possible it's a, it's a shame that the uh that the man at the top um wants to wants to act like dan snyder basically is what i'm going to go ahead and say it so i don't have any other comparison to come up with <laughs> No, that's that's exactly what I was thinking, and that's exactly what I've been thinking for a little while now. That's one of the reasons why I I, I did get involved. Again, this is pretty much um, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. This this whole thing was Doug's idea. I was just in the right place at the right time to help out a friend, and then um, when somebody wants to mess with my friends, I don't like that, especially when they've yeah. done nothing wrong. Um, yeah, and. Um, I'd like to point out that you're, you are correct in your in your statements as well, so that everybody's clear here. There are plenty of good people in this organization. We do not dislike that, those people. The reason the, te- the reason the banner was brought down is because we have sympathy and empathy with the people who are in the organization who do try to do their best and do try to make this as good of an experience for everyone and to try to include everyone. However, there are certain people at the top that were called out in the banner that we do not agree with their actions mm-hmm. currently and have not agreed with their actions since um, a lot of this reporting has come to light. Yeah. Well, Angus, thank you so much for calling in, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, you're always a pleasure to have on the show. Call in anytime. Enjoy the international break, Angus. Of course, guys. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> we've, got, oh, enjoy the international. we've got some folks here in the chat who would like us to uh, buy the spirit. I encourage... Uh, <laughs> We'd love to do that. I think it would create. I, I don't think I could, could credential myself at that point. I also believe that we need a minimum threshold of twenty million dollars net worth. So we're very close. I think we're we're right on the edge. I think if we get a few more prime subs uh, this month and some new patreons, we're we're very very close. So consider that. Yeah, and and you know I want to add some 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 thoughts. I I really think you know you we we talk about the the incident that happened uh, with with the or the the service member appreciation event and then the person they brought on to that event. You're like, well, does anyone you know does 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 mom and dad and the family in the stands care? I will tell you that m- actions that Steve Baldwin took at this game to silence fans who were critical of critical of him and his ownership of the team. Uh, that that might cause people to uh, to investigate. That might cause people to then look. They see sell the team Steve, and they're like, "Who's Steve?" Then they do research and they read about Richie Burke, and I'm like, "Oh my goodness!" You know, I had no idea this was going on. And then they're less likely to to want to you know support the team in the future. Um, and then you know the banner gets taken down. You they read the articles. I mean that that can have an impact. Uh, maybe not a small, not a big impact. There are people I'm seeing that that they say they bought season tickets and they're not buying them next year. Um, at least one person. I, you know, again, I know that's not everybody, um, but I mean the. So, one one thing one thing to bring up too maybe is sorry you're, you're laughing. I'm laughing. What's, the, what's the chat no, the chat is having a, having a fun time with okay. us twenty million. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, donate more prime subs and get us. If you all get us to twenty million, uh, we, we will we will certainly <laughs> this, consider buying this. The scarves just got a little bit more expensive. I think I think we did. I think we need to maybe make them about a hundred to uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a piece to to make it there. But. but 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 one of the one of the more interesting things has been, and one of the stories maybe that I don't think is really being talked talks about is the attendance at the games. Mm-hmm. I mean, when this team did this, and now again, it was a 
it was a sort of special event when they went from the Plex to Audi Field and they had build up and everything. Now they're playing more games there. Uh, so people have kind of a choice on and maybe that's impacting things. But I mean, do you think incidents like this are affecting attendance? Is it is it something else or like what's going on? Because this team played at least a couple games at Audi Field and they sold out 20,000. And I don't think they expected to do that every game, but I think you would expect them to maybe at least get halfway there. You know, what, what's is it the selling of the players? Is it the, the players who are no longer there? Like, you know, Rose Lavelle's not there anymore. She she was a star of the team. You have Kelly O'Hara, who I'm not going to say is not a big star, but she's certainly not at the level of like a Rose Lavelle. Um, what what do you think? The, yeah, man, the, the situation we were is? we were talking about this, too, before the game about what break even is for this team at the at Audi mm-hmm. Field, because obviously they were probably hoping to get more like the attendance they got when they only had two games there. Obviously that was sort of the motivation for doing this. Um, I think COVID is obviously a big part of it, but if you look at DC United, right? Like they're, they're still getting pretty good attendance, right? It's not, they're not sellouts, but they're, they're decent. They're, they're sort of pre COVID levels as far as attendance, even though it's hot in summer, but uh, it's, I don't know. I really don't know what the, what the real challenge is. They're, the attendance at the Loudon games are decent. They're around four. They're like three or four. Um, and I think the capacity yeah. is five and a half maybe uh, there. It's something to look at. You know, I think one thing that came up in the article uh, that before Baldwin backed out and didn't want to sell, Kang had brought to him a number of issues with the team, things that needed to be fixed. It sounded like money. Also, to me, my reading of it said financial health of the organization is, is something at play here. Um, which you you could understand. There's a lot of things if you look at the team, you can understand that that's that's like if you try to buy merch from them and realize that there's some sort of weird rigmarole you got to go through to do that. There's a lot of like small things that you could tell that the, there's a cash strapped element to the organization. Not that they don't take care of you know something that my I'm experiencing, but I think from a fan from a fan perspective, there's some of those things. So I think that's part of it. I think that I think we could I think if this team does get sold or Kang is able to take over a majority share or mo- a more of a more of a share. I'm wondering if that sort of that the kimono gets opened a little bit there to say, you know, here's here's what we need to do. We made this move. We're splitting between here and Segra. They're still probably better off than they were at Boyd as far as an overall revenue perspective. But from a cost perspective, they've got to be way, way up. So I don't I don't know. I, I think it's part COVID. I think there's almost no marketing for ticket sales in this environment. It's very mm-hmm. hard to do that, I think, as well. People are still feeling uh, not super safe about it. Um, but mar- marketing's a challenge. Budget's a challenge, I'm sure. And uh, Rose Lavelle, I mean, Rose Lavelle but, was I mean, a draw. You, I mean, Rose Lavelle was a big draw. I think I think that, yeah. that is fair to draw, that fair to point out. And, and, and you have to hope, you know, I, I, think, I think you have to hope you have two up-and-coming stars that once this, you know, once we have this cycle, we start, you know, gearing up for World Cup qualifying, a player like Trinity Rodman or Ashley Sanchez start getting call-ups, start getting appearances, uh, that they can sort of become that draw for this team um, because they're very talented players. Uh, and, and now, you know, the team just locked down Ashley Sanchez to a long-term contract. Now, you know, the nature of, of an NWSL, things can change uh, very, very quickly with, with trades. But it is good to see the team, you know, committing to a player uh, committing to a player that early, so uh, lo- I think a lot of a lot of things. I think there are a lot of things that could change that could get the team more out there. Um, I, I think you talk about. I, I think the team needs to realize that utilizing people like the Spirit Squadron, utilizing people like Rosewood Co- Collective to be that be that avenue to reach out to fans, to bring in you know bring in soccer fans and create an atmosphere at that stadium. Uh, that could that can that can really boost you, uh, regardless if it's at Loudon or at uh, or at Audi. Um, and I, I hope I hope if ownership does change hands that they're able to finally push um, push the team to say let's look to play it out. We're playing it out. And also look <laughs> at uh, so if you look at the breakdown of the ownership right now, uh, if you can do math, uh, Bill Lynch owns thirty percent, Baldwin I believe owns thirty five, mm-hmm. and then Kang I believe owns like thirty four point nine basically. So you're 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 pretty much at uh at 100 right you're i think there may be another major, minority owner in there as well and then you have Ovi and the 7000 other owners that got brought in clearly similar to LAFC these are owners there's like a like a fractional share of an owner situation mm-hmm. i'm wondering if they're able to sort of leverage their 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 mega their megaphone their brand positioning all of those things to sort of either encourage a sale or also like maybe say this is my opportunity to 
maybe make a bigger, maybe maybe get a, Ovi is the one I'm thinking of. So Ovi was looking at this originally in the interview was like, I'm thinking about my business after the fact. I'm thinking about diversifying as I'm getting older in my career. Like, you know, buy 5% here, Ovi. Like, like kick, in, kick in some actual money here. And then you have a voice at the table versus the situation right now where it's, there's only three voices and one of them apparently mm-hmm. is, is the loudest voice. Uh, Morty, Ren- <laughs> the comments again, great, great, uh, great engagement here on the, on the chat here. Uh, Morty Renee says uh, when we were talking about why this is happening, or why there aren't uh, great crowds is that she feels like there's no marketing happening except the people who already follow on Instagram or, and Twitter. And to that, I would say, uh, yes, I know RFK Refugees does that, but what about the spirit? <laughs> we have a we <laughs> we have a we have a similar challenge. And also, uh, Doug says the spirit uh, the spirit front office is not supported enough to do their jobs. The look at the number of ticket sales people there are there. If you look at the number of NWSL staff there are there, uh, you want to talk about a a skeleton crew operation. Uh, there are, it is very much a, uh, I forget the stupid phrase. I had an old boss that used to say something, uh, cook and bottle washer and something. Basically it's a dumb old person saying that means that it's a guy who does nine jobs and that's happening at mm-hmm. NWSL, the, the league itself. It's happening here at this team. It's happening in DC United too, but to a lesser extent, there's more. They've, yeah, there's D- DC United's turned that around. Yeah. I, I think they're starting to turn the corner on that. Um, I don't think there, there's as many people doing multiple jobs, uh, multiple jobs there, but I mean, it, it's, it's the nature of it's the nature of of a of an operation i think like like this and and i i don't know i you you change that with more investment um you know maybe maybe michelle kang gets majority chair she comes in and she says no i want to invest i want to invest a lot of this i want to put you know money towards this want to hire more staff i want to get more marketing i really want to give this a full chance i want to you know convince dc how much money is it going to take for us to just play at audi field full time you guys already have are going to have a w league team coming you don't need us there we're 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 clearly deserved to be on a on a on a real field um in, in a in a in a first division class stadium um so yeah we'll we'll it, we'll see i i think this could be it, it feels like we're, we're we're nearing that rock bottom where things start to maybe turn around uh, and maybe something happens this week um I, I think i think uh lisa long needs to consider she needs to step in and she needs to say oh she needs to go to steve and say look steve it's great that you've been with the team we need to we need to get you out of this out of this control you, we can figure out a way maybe that you're still an investor in this team um, but you know, or we need, we need, we need to come to a conclusion here and, and you need to pass on the reins here. Uh, this is not good. This does not look good for our league. This does not look good uh, for anybody. Um, and it's going to impact players wanting to come here. Uh, it's going to impact the overall health of the league. Uh, she, she's had a very challenging tenure as, as commissioner to say that, that is, that is a lot, a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things outside, a lot of some successes, obviously with the, with the LA team coming back, uh, is big, but. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, this is, this, this is, I think a moment for her, if she can, if she can figure out a way to get this to a resolution, not, not just the status quo. And I, and I think you talked about, you know, you, you mentioned, I think on our pre-tape that maybe, maybe Baldwin's trying to play this as a, where he gets forced out and, you know, lawsuit and you talk about an organization that's bare bones and has little investment. Uh, so uh, people may not know that a lawsuit actually tanked. The uh, the the maybe it was already going to happen. I think it was the WPS. I want to say there there was an owner. Funny funny enough, an owner of the Washington Spirit, who uh, Magic Jack FC, who moved his team, uh, and then basically there was abusive remarks. So uh, rebu- abusive remarks towards the team, um, towards the uh, towards the team and the players. That seems like common thread here. And, that seems like that's a that yeah. Seems like that's something that just happens here. Yeah. It? And, and, and the league forced him out, and he sued, and then the league shuttered their doors, uh, or they basically gave him control and said, "We're done." Uh, that that was the end of the WPS uh, as an organization. So uh, this is not new to, to to women's soccer, and and the NWSL has been the has been able to survive and exist. Um, and right now, that is a huge, huge success story for this league because there have been a lot of leagues that have come up and have folded very quickly. Yeah. Um, so I, I called it. Yeah. I think I called it the, the Deloy Hansen uh, stratagem here. I think that potentially is happening here. <laughs> I think that the only way that we're going to see this happen is if the league, if Lisa Baird really, really steps in and and, and asserts herself. But we'll see. I think trying to find. I'm trying to find that owner, Dan ba- Dan Boris Law. That's the guy. Jeez. 
He's at, he is worse than Steve Baldwin, guys. Go 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 do some research. <laughs> go go do some research on him if you guys. I know I know I know it was 20, 2011, but there may be some people who, who who maybe were not familiar with that whole drama that was going on there. So, um yes. So, uh, I do also want to talk about the game a little bit here. It was uh you know, it was it was a 0-0 draw as we sort of talked about before. I as as the game started uh, before the game, it was sort of a question is can the spirit come out the same way they did against the Courage when they beat them 2-0 during the Olympics break, when no, when there was no Dabinia, there was no Lynn Williams, uh, and there was no Abby Ursig. Or Abby Ursig did, was there in the Olympics game, wasn't actually here for this game. But that was a game where the spirit came out, uh, really dominated them coast to coast from the start of the game to the end of the game, uh, dribbling uh, past everyone. Ashley Sanchez had a fantastic game. That did not happen, unfortunately. Uh, the game, if you, if you have had a chance to check out uh, either uh, Black and Red United's uh, review of the game, RFKRefugees.com has one as well. Uh, that you know, it, it was a lot. There were a lot of chances. I believe they had the Spirit had something like I don't have the stats in front of me, but it was uh, they had less shots on goal, but they had about twenty something shots. I think they had twenty four shots uh, uh, in the in the entire game. The first half was. Uh, sort of possession without penetration. There was lots of outside shots. There was not. There were not a lot of real solid opportunities. The second half, the game really opened up from from both directions. Uh, the courage and the spirit were uh, really looking for a goal. There was a post, I believe, from a from a Sanchez close range shot. There were countless shots uh, right over the crossbar for this for uh, for the spirit. Um, a goal line saved by the courage at a certain point. So it was. It was a game that felt like a goal was coming for like 30 minutes of the second half, uh, but it didn't. It, mm-hmm. didn't. it did not come. A draw against the Courage is not a problem. Uh, producer Brian has says 21 shots for the Spirit, four on target, and I believe there were five shots on target for the Courage overall in the game, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the uh, it was a game that they would have liked to have won, and they probably should have, I think, based on based on the the, the run of play. Uh, but a draw against the courage, the second place team is is not is not anything that you want to sneeze at. They're going to play Portland this weekend. That game is going to be very challenging. Portland is a complete steamroller. They have uh, either an eight or a ten point lead at the top of the table. Uh, they can they can <laughs> they can run roughshod on teams with their second with their second eleven. Uh, so that is a game that you will really hope. I, that's a that's a draw. I hope that's a that's a, a point on the road would be would be fantastic if that were to be able to happen. Yeah, I mean, basically, the, the the league, with the exception, you know, basically the the difference between eighth and 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 third or is 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 four points. Uh, so there there's a lot of of tight, and I think they mentioned it on the broadcast a little bit. Um, they talked about how for a lot of coaches, it's you know we need to focus on ourselves. We're not going to think about the league. We need to go out and get the most points that we can get out of this. Um. And, uh, and, and, you know, like you said, I, I thought, you know, I, I guess some thoughts, some thoughts I maybe had from the game. Um, you know, I thought, uh, Sanchez again, looks good. Uh, you know, I thought, I thought, uh, Audrey Bledsoe came out and made some really, really good saves. Um, I, I, Lynn Williams, I felt like was going to pounce and I thought this was going to lead to a, to a, to a disappointing loss, um, in this game, but, uh, Bledsoe came out and just made some, some absolutely incredible saves in this game. Yeah. A lot of them. Uh, Kelly O'Hara also looked really good too. She did. Uh, going down the line. She, she made some good, op- good, created some good opportunities for the team. Yeah. Bledsoe was very good at getting off of her line to sort of snuff out chances. Cause a lot of, a mm-hmm. lot of the opportunities were, uh, were balls over the top, sort of charted trying to challenge the center backs. Emily Sonnet looked very good uh, in center back. Something to note was Paige Nielsen playing right back. Um, was it was it right back or left? Back? Right back, uh, a position that she uh, she's known to play everywhere, but she also play, she also played right back. She looked pretty good there. She picked up a knock and made it to about the 60th minute. Uh, Rodder came in and replaced her, and I think mm-hmm. uh, looked fantastic as well. So the back line, I think. The reinforcements of the Olympians coming back to the back line will help. I think the defense has gotten stout again. It's really a matter of continuing to put the pressure on, continuing to to finish the opportunities as as they're being created. They are being created. I think that they would less they would like to settle less uh, for shots outside the box like they had to in this game. Uh, that was not that's not really been the way that they've scored, but they were forced into it by a courage defense that was uh, sort of giving them yeah. That. 
the the courage bait the courage are doing a very good job staying compact in that box and not and, and really I think their their whole goal of this game is we cannot get into a track meet with Trinity Rodman and Ashley Sanchez because we will lose that game uh, and their idea was to stay very compact and they, and they did they did a, they did a good job at that um, there were a, a Spirit got a couple of chances they have a lot of quality there uh, but you know I thought they did enough to sort of keep it from keep it from being like where you're, you're thinking you're going to score a goal. I mean, you, you hold a team, they get 21 shots, and they're only able to put four on target. It means they're taking a lot from outside the 18. Uh, so the, you would like to see the Spirit put a little bit more opportunities right at, right at the – Right at the uh, right at the po- right at the keeper, uh, maybe get some more close up opportunities. I think Ashley Hatch was a little bit invisible in this game. I can't remember too many real clear cut opportunities she got in this game. Maybe one I can I can think of in the back of my head. Um, but uh, but yeah, we'll 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 see what ha- they got a game next week. Um, we will uh, we will not be back uh, next Monday. We are we are we are taking a little bit of a break. You are you are you uh, are witness to the first RFK refugees thirteen day break in three years, probably. I think that that's probably right. <laughs> uh, if something changes here with the spirit in the next thirteen days, we will we will reconvene. We will come back from our uh, our my ties on the beach virtual vacation that we're but we're all taking from each other. Uh, but uh, if it doesn't, then we're actually going to take a little bit of a break uh, and. Uh, you know, watch the international games uh, and maybe probably tweet about it. I'm sure th- tweeting's never on vacation, yeah. never log off. <laughs> so that's that's what that's going on. But thank you, everybody, to join the show. Thank you to Gregory, who is just gifting everybody, <laughs> gifting everybody subs here in the chat. Uh, if you want to support us, we really appreciate it, particularly if you already were an Amazon Prime subscriber. They reset every month because this is stupid and a scam. Not by us, but by Amazon. So if you want to do that again, please uh, log back in sometime in the next month and throw us your sub. Uh, and, and we really do appreciate that. This has been a lot more fun. I think d- sort of the engagement on Twitch has been really cool. There's lots more stuff that we can do than yeah. we could have done on YouTube. So thank you, everybody, for uh, for doing that, for joining us. And the, 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 the community and the chat is very vibrant and, and, and adds another fun element to the show. But uh, I, I think... I think we're going to go into a very brief hibernation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, SCM Ultra, yeah, I'm uh, I, I, doing a USMNT pod needs, I need two people interested. And right. And John is not, <laughs> not an interested party. So, so look for Look for Twitter. We'll probably talk about a little bit about the USMNT. Uh, that is not our, that is not our wheelhouse. There, there are a lot of other, uh, a lot of other great shows. Uh, best soccer show with Jason Davis, Jared Dubois. They they do an excellent job. Uh, go feel free to check out them uh, to talk uh, to talk some some U.S. soccer. Uh, we're gonna take a break. I think we're all we're all we're all wanting a little bit a little bit of time before we get into the 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 sprint towards the end for for DC United and then it, it, hopefully into the playoffs and we get some playoff games to talk about. Guys, you guys are incredible. You guys are amazing. Um, you you guys really help keep the show going. Thanks so much to Rich and Angus for calling in, especially Angus uh, for giving us the story. Giving us giving us some more details uh, about what happened uh, on Saturday. Um, hopefully uh, that we, we get some positive news related to the spirit. Hopefully the positive news continues for the DC. I think all I think you know what I could I could handle the US losing all three games if Paul Riola, Edison Flores, and Andy Nahar all come or I guess Paul Riola gets healthy, but uh, Edison Flores and uh, and Andy Nahar come back healthy. Wrap them in that, that is wrap. my number one. <laughs> that is my number one. My number one thing right now. If any of them get injured, I am not going to be a, a happy camper. It will not be a fun vacation. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you so so much for listening. You guys are incredible. We will catch you guys uh, in a couple weeks unless things change. Bye. <laughs>